Thorne Miller, and on behalf of the University of Iowa Lecture Committee, we welcome you tonight to tonight's event. Uh, just a quick plug about upcoming Lecture Committee events. Uh, we welcome you to join us back here in the main lounge at the IMU for tomorrow evening. At 7 p.m., we'll be featuring a lecture by Dr. James Hansen, another part of uh, the expo here. I know that I cannot wait to see him tomorrow. Uh, a couple things I do want to say is just a giant thank you to each and every one of you that came out to tonight's event, and we encourage you to see your faces back here tomorrow throughout tomorrow's events throughout the day in the IMU main lounge and the lecture. Uh, our other lecture event for the semester will be on October 29th. We're going to be welcoming philanthropist Alex Sheen to the Sheraton Hotel. That event will start at 7.30 p.m., and that's in partnership with the University of Iowa Dance Marathon. Any information for upcoming lecture committee events can be found on our website. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's debate, and that would be Mr. John Carlson. Mr. Carlson graduated from the University of Chicago School of Law, where he went on to a career in both practice and academia. He's been featured in law reviews and uh, as a published author and has provided his expertise in international environmental law and global climate and uh, global warming politics and law. Uh, since 1983, he has been a distinguished member of the University of Iowa School of Law faculty, and it's our pleasure tonight to welcome him as a moderator in this evening's debate. So please join me in welcoming Mr. John Carlson. Thank you. I, I don't tend to do much moderation. I intend to, to introduce our, our debate panelists and let them uh, moderate themselves. But it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to tonight's debate on the topic resolved that the United States should adopt and implement a plan to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2030. I'll repeat that a couple of times because at the end of the debate we're going to ask you all uh, to vote for or against the proposition. Tonight's debate is the first in several discussions over the next 24 hours about renewable energy policy. Tomorrow we're going to have a, a day of expert panels addressing some of the stickiest issues in renewable energy policy. And our lead debaters tonight will also be delivering keynote addresses during tomorrow's session, as will Dr. James Hansen, who will speak during the day in addition to his public lecture at night. I hope many of you will be able to join us. If you haven't already registered, you can register at the door tomorrow. Uh, for students, it's free. For uh, general public, it's $15. Unfortunately, uh, no lunch because we've already ordered all the food for the people who pre-registered. But if you aren't already registered, we'd love to see you uh, tomorrow. Before we begin, I want to express my thanks um, to the people who've made this debate and, in fact, the entire symposium possible. First, there's a number of staff at the University of Iowa Public Policy Center and the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research who have really been the prime movers behind this. Pete Damiano, the director of the center, Leslie Gannon, the community engagement coordinator who you may have met when you came in, Alex Sukolsky, the senior IT support um, consultant, Stephen Williams, our community engagement assistant, and then Senator uh, Joe Bolcom, who's the outreach and community education director at Seagrer. Um, all of them have uh, put in a lot of hours to make this happen. And then there are our sponsors, not to be forgotten, the people who funded all of this. Uh, the Iowa National Science Foundation EPSCOR provided, um, I think, most of the funding. The Iowa Energy Center chipped in. The UI School of Urban and Regional Planning has helped out. The Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research, the UI Lecture Committee, the Oberman Center, and the UNI Center for Energy and Environmental uh, education has also contributed. Okay, so let's debate. The topic for this evening, again, resolved that the United States should adopt and implement a plan to achieve 100% renewable energy by 2030. Um, we're privileged to have four outstanding advocates in tonight's debate, and I want to introduce them in the order of their speeches. 
Uh, first, speaking first for the proposition will be Mark Jacobson. Professor Jacobson is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University, where he is the director of the Atmosphere Energy Program. He's also a senior fellow of the Woods Institute for the Environment and a senior fellow of the Precord Institute for Energy. He develops and applies computer models to understand air pollution, global warming, and renewable energy resources. He's authored two textbooks and um, 140 peer-reviewed articles. Uh, in 2013, he received the American Geophysical Union's Ascent Award, and he's also appeared on the David Letterman Show, which, so this is kind of a come down from that, I guess. Speaking second against the resolution will be Robert Bryce. Mr. Bryce is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and one of America's most prominent journalists. He writes on a variety of public policy subjects in publications ranging from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times to the National Review and Counterpunch. He lectures widely and has given over 200 invited and keynote addresses across the US and Canada. In fact, he just came here from my home state of North Dakota uh, where he was lecturing uh, a couple of days ago. He's the author of five books on energy policy. His latest book, Smaller, Faster, Lighter, Denser, Cheaper, How Innovation Keeps Proving the Catastrophists Wrong, was published in May 2014. Our third speaker is Jeffrey Ding. Mr. Ding will join Professor Jacobson in support of the proposition. Uh, Jeffrey is a UI junior majoring in political science, economics, and Chinese. You know, I can't imagine these multiple majors. Uh, he's been involved in debate for the past nine years. When he was a senior in high school, he and his partner, high school partner, Liam Hancock, won both the national debate tournaments, which is an exceedingly rare accomplishment for a high school debater to top out both the national debates. Jeffrey is currently vice president of UI student government. And our fourth speaker uh, will be Liam Hancock, who will join Mr. Bryce in speaking against the proposition. And yes, if you're listening, this is the same Liam Hancock who was Jeffrey's partner on the high school debate team. Um, so debaters are used to going together or against each other. Um, Liam is a Ju UI junior majoring in political science and economics. He coaches debate at West High and he continues in collegiate debate. And last year he placed in the top 16 at the collegiate national debate tournament as a sophomore. So I'm sure he's hoping for more. Uh, this year. The format for the debate is as follows. Professor Jacobson will speak for 10 minutes in support of the proposition. Mr. Bryce will then speak for 10 minutes against the proposition. Mr. Ding will then have five minutes in favor of the proposition and he'll be cross-examined by Mr. Hancock for three minutes. Mr. Hancock will then speak against the proposition for five minutes and he'll be cross-examined for three minutes by Mr. Ding. And then after a short break, if they wish it, Professors Jacobson and Mr. Bryce will each have three minutes for a rebuttal. Uh, so I urge you to give each speaker your full and respectful attention. Following the uh, speeches, we'll ask for uh, a vote to determine whether this house, this audience, agrees with the proposition or not. And following that vote, or while well, the vote's being co um, counted, we'll open the floor for questions and comments. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our first speaker, the Professor.
power, and we're looking, by the way, at not only electric power, but also transportation, heating and cooling, and industry. So these are all energy sectors. But we need all sources of these sectors to be clean and renewable energy sources by 2020, such that we can retire, gradually retire existing infrastructure and replace it with new stuff. And when we have new demand, we'd add uh, new clean infrastructure. And so this would result in about, by 2030, 80 to 85% conversion if we did this with aggressive policies and if we could do it with completely aggressive policies, 100% conversion by 2030. But as I said, that may be less likely. But at least by 2050, we'd have 100% conversion with 80 to 85% by 2030. Now, what are the benefits of doing this? Uh, there are really four main areas of benefits. Uh, one is in terms of air pollution reduction and its costs. Uh, in the United States alone, there are about 60 to 70,000 people die prematurely from air pollution from the fossil fuel energy infrastructure. And this costs over $500 billion per year, about 3% of the GDP of the United States. So this is a drag on the economy. And there are hundreds of thousands of more people are ill due to air pollution, cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, complications from asthma, and this is included in these costs that I'm referring to. Uh, global warming is a severe and growing problem, and uh, we estimate that by 2050, U.S. emissions alone will cost about $700 billion of global costs from just U.S. emissions. So this is another you know, three to four percent of the GDP of the United States. And another issue, and by the way, this is a really important to address quickly because the Arctic sea ice is disappearing rapidly, may be gone in 10 to 30 years, which is why we need to act today to prevent a tipping point. Uh, if the Arctic ice disappears, then you change the reflective ice surface to a dark ocean below that's more absorbing of solar radiation, heating up the ocean faster, and this can trigger faster warming and faster climate consequences. Uh, a third reason that we need to address, uh, do such a conversion, is price stability of energy. We look gradually, we see that energy prices are gradually rising because we use fossil fuels, which are limited resources. And if you just look historically at the cost of energy, it just goes up and up and up over time because you have to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels. And especially the transport, you can look at the cost of energy, say, uh, in Hawaii, it's about, 35 cents a kilowatt hour. You go to American Samoa, either, even further away, it's about 50 cents a kilowatt hour, whereas the average in the US is 13 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. But if you, and you, you get these rising prices over time, uh, not only due to distance, but the fact you have to mine and transport the fuels, uh, whereas you know, wind and solar have zero fuel costs, and so you, even though they have higher capital costs, they have zero fuel costs, so you stabilize the price of energy. And just to give you an example, if you look at the 10 states in the United States that have the highest fraction of their electricity from wind, and which are those, which are the top ones? Iowa. Yeah. Iowa and South Dakota, and Texas is number 10, by the way. And so those top 10 states, uh, the cost of electricity has actually, on average, over those states in the last five years has decreased 0.4%, or it's about the same in five years. All the other states, the cost of electricity went up 8%, which illustrates that when you have fossil fuels, you increase your prices of electricity in particular, but also you'll see this with oil and gas. You also would stabilize the price and, in fact, reduce the cost of driving because electric cars, even though they have higher capital costs, uh, they have one-fifth the fuel cost of gasoline cars because the, the plug-to-wheel efficiency of an electric car is about 80 to 86 percent, whereas that for a gasoline car is about 17 to 20 percent on average. So the cost of driving an electric car is about 80 cents a gallon equivalent. So somebody who drives an electric car saves over, over 15 years, driving 15,000 miles a year, saves $20,000 in fuel costs versus, uh, and, and would, if the price of gasoline doubles, then they'd save $40,000. So my point is you'd, you'd save money in, even in transportation. Uh, the fourth reason is job creation. If you actually convert the energy infrastructure, you would create, uh, in, the, in the whole US, we did actually a state-by-state -state analysis. We'd create about uh, 7.5 million total jobs, about, uh, four, about 
There was about five million of those were construction jobs, averaged 40-year construction jobs, and two and a half million 40-year operation jobs. And they would cost about four million fossil fuel and nuclear jobs. And so there's a net creation of about three and a half million jobs due to this, such a conversion. Now, as I said, this conversion would be in all sectors. And questions that arise are, you know, is there enough material? And the answer is yes, there are enough materials to do this conversion. How much land does it take up? Well, it does not take up much land. Uh, the f we would envision uh, that 50% of all new energy in 2050, in fact, uh, when you do a conversion to wind, water, and solar, first of all, when you do this conversion, you reduce power demand in the US by about 38%. Uh, about 33% reduction due to the fact that electricity is so much more efficient, as in the example for transportation, than internal combustion. So you reduce your power demand, and so you actually need less energy. And then there's lot, you can use end-use energy efficiency improvements on top of that. And conservatively, you can get, let's say, 38, you can even get up to 48% reduction of energy just by converting to electricity and end-use power demand. Now, how would that energy provi be provided? And this is if you convert everything to electricity. Well, we'd envision about 30% onshore wind, about 20% offshore wind, about 38% uh, uh, solar, which is divided into about 8.5% uh, rooftop solar, and mo about 28% uh, utility scale solar, uh, PV, and the rest concentrated solar power. And then tiny amounts or small amounts of geothermal and existing hydroelectric power and tiny amounts of wave power and tidal power. So that would power the whole US. Uh, all the solar for rooftops would be on existing rooftops or parking structures. Uh, offshore wind doesn't take up new land. Onshore wind, the land, most of its space in between land, so you can use it for farming or rangeland or cropland or agriculture or open space. So it really comes down to utility scale solar taking up new land, and this total new land is less than half a percent of the United States for footprint, and about two to two and a half percent for spacing in between wind turbines. So it's not very much land. Now, you might ask about intermittency. People complain, well, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. That's true, but this the new grid will be completely different. Uh, first of all, right now, if we convert to electricity and transportation, uh, it, convert everything to tra uh, like transportation to electricity, for example, trans transportation is like a, what's called a flexible load if it's electrified. That means you can power your car most any time of the day, or if you plug it in overnight, it can be powered any time during the night that the utility uh, that you agree with the utility to power it. So that you have a flexible load that can be shifted during the day. And when you, wind and solar are complementary in nature, so when the wind is not blowing, the sun is usually shining during the day and vice versa. And in places where you have hydroelectric, you can use hydro to fill in the gaps. And you can use concentrated solar power with up to 15 or 18 hours of storage uh, as one mechanism of storage. There are other types of storage, including uh, using ice storage, uh, using uh, thermal energy storage, underground storage in soil, uh, using chilled water, heating, chilled water. Uh, there's many, there are many types of storage that you can combine uh, along with the uh, combining wind and solar and then using, oversizing the grid too to create more wind and so solar than you need for electric power. And when you have too much wind and solar, you use it to produce hydrogen, which would be for part of the part of the energy economy would be powered by hydrogen, some in transportation, some in heating and cooling. Although it's much more efficient to use electricity when you can. So it's really an optimization problem, not rocket science. And we actually did a study for California finding we could power the grid 99.8% of the hours over two years uh, just using wind, solar, geothermal, and hydroelectric and without any actual storage except for hydroelectric and concentrated solar power. So anyway, to summarize, there are, it's, it's not, uh, it's totally technically and economically feasible to do a conversion of the energy infrastructure by 2030. It's more socially and politically likely to occur by 2050. There are many benefits of doing this. There's very little downside. So uh, I will just stop right there and let uh, um, my opponent give the next talk. Thank you.
The caption fails for three reasons. First, scale. Second, the environment. And finally, economics. Scale. We use more oil than any other form of energy. We're now using about 19 million barrels of oil per day here in the United States. It provides roughly 37% of our total energy consumption. If we were, uh, Professor Jacobson has insisted that we can go to all electric vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, etc. Well, let's walk through this though and realize that our existing base of transportation is all liquid fuel based. Therefore, we are going to have to have biofuels. Currently, we produce roughly 570,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day in the form of biofuels. Almost all of that is corn ethanol. To go to 100% uh, replacement for our oil needs by 2030, we would have to see a 30-fold increase in biofuel production. How realistic is that and what would we be talking about in terms of land use? Last year, in, a, in an article that was published in Strategic Studies Quarterly, the U.S. Air Force's most uh, prestigious journal, Ike, Ike Kiefer calculated the amount of land that would be needed to grow enough biofuels to replace oil in the U.S. transportation sector. Thoroughly footnoted his, his article titled, titled Energy Insecurity, Kiefer wrote, to replace the 28 exajoules of energy the United States uses every year, just for cars, trucks, and airplanes, would require more than 700 million acres of corn. This is 37% of the total area of the continental US. Iowa covers 36 million acres. Thus, if we need 700 million acres of corn, we would need 19 Iowas planted in wall-to-wall -wall corn. There'd be no room for houses, no room for the Iowa Memorial Union, and more importantly, there'd be no room for shorts or the airliner. But the issue here is not just the fuel we put into our transportation equipment, it's the transportation equipment itself. Today we have roughly 253 million motor vehicles in America, 222,000 private airplanes, 7,000 commercial planes, 12 million recreational boats, and 24,000 locomotives, and nearly every one of them runs on refined oil products. And yet the caption says that we have to go to 100% renewables by 2030. So the, the caption by itself on its face, we should, uh, you should vote against the caption because to assume that we're going to simply do away with our entire transportation infrastructure in the next 16 years and replace it with electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells, or I don't know, electric airplanes, hydrogen fueled airplanes, battery fueled airplanes, it's, it's, it's ludicrous on its face. Electricity. Let's look at electricity. I'm pleased that, that Dr. Jacobson mentioned his goal for 30% of U.S. electricity coming from onshore wind. Wind turbines are, uh, I'm, I'm a critic of the wind business. I'll be very clear about that. I'm a critic of the biofuel business as well. What's the power density of wind energy? It's one watt per square meter. What is power density? Power density is a measure of energy flow. It can be harnessed in a given area, volume, or mass. The power density of wind energy is one watt per square meter. And in my latest book, I, I document this with six different studies, six different analyses. The US currently has th 300 gigawatts, 300 billion watts of coal-fired capacity. The US gets roughly 30% of its, a little more than 30% of its electricity from coal. So using Professor Jacobson's number, 30% onshore wind, how much land would be required for this 30% of our electricity to come from wind turbines. Well, let's look at coal, 300 gigawatts, 300 billion watts. At one watt per square meter with wind, that's 300 billion square meters. That's 300,000 square kilometers. This is a land area the size of Italy. It's a land area twice the size of Iowa. And here's the kicker, because of the noise that these turbines make, you can't have any people living on this property. Rangeland, farmland, okay, yes, maybe, but the wind doesn't blow everywhere in the United States. We're gonna set aside a land area the size of Italy solely for wind turbines? Takes me to my next point, the environment. 
Small footprints are the environmental ideal. Small is beautiful. Density is green. It's one reason why I'm so adamantly pro-nuclear, because the power density of nuclear is so incredibly high. To achieve the goal of the caption, 100% renewable energy by 2030, we will have to trade environmental diversity for sterility. To achieve the stated goal, the U.S. will have to simply accept widespread killing of some of America's most iconic wildlife, including bald and golden eagles. In March of last year, in a peer-reviewed study published in the Wildlife Society Bulletin, in 2012 alone, wind turbines in the U.S. killed 573,000 birds, among those 83,000 raptors. In addition, the study estimated bat kills at 880,000 per year. Last September, September of, of, of last year, the Fish and Wildlife Service's top raptor biologist estimated that between 2007 and 2011 alone, the documented number of eagle kills by wind turbines increased 12-fold. They documented 85 eagle kills since 1997, and Joel Pagel, the lead author of the report, told me when I interviewed him for a story that I published in the Wall Street Journal, that figure was an absolute minimum. They have now documented eagle kills in 14 different states. Pagel's study was published just five months after the Fish and Wildlife Service itself issued a report which said flatly, there are no conservation measures that have been scientifically shown to redu reduce eagle disturbance and blade strike mortality at wind projects. Turbines kill bats, which are an integral part of our ecosystem. I interviewed Merlin Tuttle a few months ago, the founder of Bat Conservation International. He said, quote, anyone familiar with bat population biology is deeply concerned about the impact of wind turbines on the long-term viability of a number of bat species. The sprawl that comes with widespread deployment of wind turbines is, in fact, anti-environmental. The backlash against the wind industry is real, it is global, and it is growing. In April, 4,000 people marched in the streets of Dublin, Ireland against wind turbine encroachment in the Irish countryside. Similar protests have been held in Wales. At least two dozen towns in New York State have passed ordinances prohibiting the construction of wind turbines. The fight is simple. Landowners do not want 500-foot-high wind turbines built in their neighborhoods. They don't want them built on their ridge tops. They don't want to look at the red blinking lights on top of these wind turbines all night, every night. And they don't want to deal with the infrasound and low-frequency noise that is emitted by wind turbines. Now, this is something the wind industry desperately wants to dismiss, but the problem is real and it has been documented numerous times. If you like, Google a man named Dave Enns. E-N-Z is his last name. He and his wife are now living in an RV. They had a, they have a farm outside of Denmark, Wisconsin. They had a number of wind turbines built within a few thousand feet of their homes. The, wind, the noise from the wind turbines kept them up at night. They can't sleep in their own home. The idea that we will cover the countryside with wind turbines is madness. The caption fails but it, it, because it assumes that we have to destroy the environment in order to save it. Now let me move on finally to economics. I have two minutes left, or now about a minute left. This idea that we can move to renewables and that it won't cost us anything has been proven false simply by looking at Germany. Germany has set a goal of getting 80% of its electricity from renewables by 2050. Just its electricity, the caption before us today, is 100% of our energy from renewables by 2030. Over the past decade, German consumers have subsidized renewable energy programs to the tune of $100 billion. In January, Germany's economy and energy minister said his country is risking, quote, dramatic deindustrialization if it doesn't reduce energy costs. In August, the Wall Street Journal reported industrial electricity costs in Germany have risen 60% in the last five years alone. The German government estimates the push for renewables will cost about $1.4 trillion by 2040, and, and, and that will have, that's roughly half of Germany's current GDP. Why is it costing so much? Because renewables are more expensive than conventional electricity. I'm pro-solar. I have solar panels on the roof of my house. Solar costs are coming down. But if you look at the latest data from the Energy Information Administration, an arm of the Department of Energy, they document it by, by 2019 in their estimate. Natural gas-fired electricity will cost $66 per megawatt hour. 
By comparison, wind will cost $80 per megawatt hour, 21% more. Offshore wind, $200 per hour, per megawatt hour, three times the cost of natural gas. Solar PV, more than twice the cost of natural gas. And solar thermal, four times the cost of natural gas. You must vote against the caption because of scale, environment, and economics. Thank you. So before I start my speech time, I um, just want to say thank you to the University of Iowa Public Policy Center and the Lecture Committee for hosting this debate. Um, just a little bit of background with me and Liam. We were high school debate partners and freshman year of our high school debate year when we were just um, very arrogant novices, we actually had a physical fight over the railroad's disadvantage. It was like this shiny new argument and we rolled over on the floor battling who would get the last file for the debate tournament. So I view this debate as the culmination of this long rivalry we've had. So whoever wins this will determine that. But I'm sure you're here for us as the speakers. So, um, all right, let's start this speech. Um, Mr. Bryce talks about this caption, but he misses the bigger picture. He's conceded every single one of our advantages about the big picture impacts. There is no ultimate impact claim in any of his arguments. Sure, even if they win an increase in land use, even if they win some form of infeasibility, even if they win some species lofts from birds, all of that is outweighed by the magnitude of climate change, by 62,000 deaths per year from air pollution, by the 3.5 million jobs that are not being created if we continue to do fossil fuels, and also by the energy price volatility that will ultimately cause huge swings in our energy system and cause it to be unsustainable. So it is try or die for the affirmative, right? Even if they win minor disadvantages and minor infeasibilities, we still have this overall big picture of reasons as to why we're doing the plan. Um, I will address his three criticisms first. Um, as, for the one of, as for the one of scale, we do not, the Jacobson studies and articles completely exclude biofuels from wind, water, and solar. Um, the two alternatives proposed are hydrogen fuel vehicles and battery electric vehicles. Yes, we need to change the fuel infra infrastructure. Yes, that takes time. In the meantime, there would be other, other solid waste um, fill-ins, um, things like miscanthus that are being uh, built in, at the Office of Sustainability right now. That would allow for the transition in the transportation sector. Additionally, he makes the arguments about the environment and, uh, and, and uh, wind destroying birds. First, they've conceded two framing issues. We would reduce demand of electricity and power by 38% just through the implementation of the 100% renewable energy because it has a symbiotic relationship with energy efficiency. Um, things like net metering all increase energy efficiency and reduce the overall consumption of, uh, of consumers. Second, he's conceded that 0.44% of land would be needed for all of WWS transfer, uh, tr infrastructure transformation. Additionally, the second framing issue is does not address offshore wind. Um, the East Coast is considered the Saudi Arabia offshore wind and would be able to supply a huge amount of demand. His arguments about wind killing birds ignore the fact that buildings kill 1 billion birds per year. Um, power, lines kill four, uh, power lines kill 174 million birds per year. That's from the Fish and Wildlife Service statistics. And finally, that natural gas and coal kill comparatively eight to nine times more birds per year than wind. So there is no argument here. I'm all for saving 88 bald eagles, but climate change causes destruction of biodiversity on Earth. The mass extinctions in history have been due to extreme climatic temperature disruptions. His last argument is one of economics. He mentions um, Germany. Here's a couple of the most recent statistics on uh, German production. The first quarter in 2014, 27% of Germany's energy share came from renewable energy. Um, that was the, for the first time, that took the top spot in terms of primary energy production. It shows the increasing trend from the Mercator Foundation and European Climate Foundation. Um, the arguments about increasing in costs, real yes, retail price costs would increase, but wholesale price costs decreased by a lot more, um, which proves that eventually those costs would become low enough for the transition to occur. 
Um, the argument about subsidies, claiming that German total spending on 100 billion subsidies, subsidies so far, including all the years, that those pale in comparison to the seven to the 70.2 billion dollars of subsidies that fund the fossil fuel industry annually in the United States. Um, so we need to have those. Uh, incentives from the federal government to counteract what has been an entrenched fossil fuel industry that is causing the four main impacts we've identified with the affirmative. The only way to combat that, the only way to combat that is to initially create these capital, initially transform the infrastructure, and then eventually those costs will go down as, as economies of scale um, come to fruition. Is there any other points you want me to address? Okay, thanks. Jeffrey, the first question I want to ask is, the prompt says that we should implement a plan to achieve this renewable development. I guess there's been a lot of discussion of how good it would be if this renewable development suddenly happened, but what exactly is the plan? The plan to establish 100% renewables by 2030 would include things like WWS, um, specific government proposals that that would include would be green building tax credit programs, streamlining the permit approval process for power generators for WWS technology, increasing a renewable portfolio standard, I guess, solar production tax credits, so all these for great example, policies that uh, in combination You make a point about offshore wind, uh, yeah. which is uh, over twice as expensive as onshore wind and over three times as expensive as natural gas. Who foots the bill for building these offshore wind farms? Well, it's only three times as expensive in natural gas when you take into current economic cost calculations, right? All of your ec economic calculations are based off of pure dollar figures that don't take into account Professor Jacobson's calculation of the social well, cost. Well, calculations aside, like who air pays for Like it? air pollution, which I would argue should be included in the cost of an energy Jacobson source. studies admit that natural gas is uh, less than a tenth uh, of an air pollutant is conventional fossil fuels. What is the difference in air pollution between natural gas and renewables? Well, well na renewables are comparatively better for air pollution. Um, additionally, natural gas emits VOCs, volatile organic compounds, that independently create health problems. Uh, speaking of air pollution, the single largest contributor to air pollution is the transportation sector. How are you going to convince trucking industries to start using electric trucks when those take hours to recharge every couple hundred miles? I mean, the argument is that eventually we would, trans we would transform the current transportation infrastructure into having more electrical vehicle stations, but there would be a transition process that is included in the Jacobson model, um, which would include solid waste as a biofuel, as a fuel source um, in the transition period. Okay. Um, in, terms of, in terms of global warming, what exactly does this American plan do for countries like China and India who are just increasing emissions every day? Yeah, China and India, um, China now has the largest wind capacity in the world. Um, there's a misperception, misperception gap where we're like, China and India aren't doing anything. The reality is they realize that energy volatility is an inevitability. Well, they realize here's that- Here's the misperception shale gap. If over the last 10 years, American GHGs went to zero, global emissions would still have increased because of all of the other countries in the world. Right, but my argument is that other countries in the world, due to competitiveness, innovation, energy price stability reasons, are already pursuing these renewable energies. Additionally, if we send a strong signal that we can turn to 100%, it would create a modeling signal to the rest of the world. Um, it would show that we are, we are showing this obligation to consider the social cost of our economic actions. I wish I had something nearly as cute to say as Jeffrey did. Uh, what did I say this? Uh, it's not our first time speaking on the other side of bright lights, but uh, might be our last, so I love you, Jeff. <coughs> Jeffrey makes a big point about the impacts, the big consequences, climate change, air pollution, jobs. 
none of them should be a consideration if their plan is nothing but a pipe dream. If we can't actually achieve the type of emissions reductions, air pollution reductions, economic growth that they claim would be good, endorsing the caption is worthless. They haven't really answered any of our disputes to the feasibility of their plan. The most important is scale. There's not a reasonable means to replace the transportation infrastructure. Yes, theoretically, new technologies could arise. People have been working on those for decades, and they're not here. There's an entire liquid infrastructure that permeates the entirety of transportation from planes to trucks to buses to cars, and there's been no shift. And those are the largest contributors to air pollution and the second largest contributor to emissions. They also haven't addressed the social factor. Even if there are government programs that encourage people for a profit motive to pursue renewables, there will still be social resistance. Things like the not in my backyard movement or people like David Enns who experience sickness because of proximity to wind farms. They haven't explained how these wind farms could be built when people don't want them there, when people refuse to let a wind farm be built on or near their property. Or things like litigation. What if all of the billions of dollars invested in fossil fuel infrastructure was instantly outlawed, priced out of the market, et cetera. The government would be on the hook for all of that. But the main problem is intermittency. There's not a means for us to reliably depend upon renewables for energy generation. Because people use different amounts of power at different times in the day. When the Super Bowl is on, demand for electricity is pretty high. Every TV is on. At nighttime, there's less demand for electricity. The problem with renewables is we don't have a means to respond to increasing demands in electricity. We can't blow on the windmill a little harder or shine a flashlight on our solar panels to increase the amount of energy we're producing. Dr. Jacobson brings up benefits of renewable energy like decreasing energy costs. But those decreases in costs come from the combination of renewable energy with physical fuels. The reason why wind energy doesn't increase energy prices in Iowa is because in Iowa, we can respond to increases in electricity demand by ramping up coal plants, by ramping up natural gas plants to respond to demand. That creates stability, which is what brings price down. Even if the capital costs of wind farms are low, the uncertainty of the energy enough is to increase energy prices. Dr. Jacobson gives the example of Hawaii, where energy prices are 35 cents per kilowatt hour. Do you know where else you can find energy prices like that? in Germany, except they're about 37 cents per kilowatt hour after all of that renewable development. The second problem is one of economics. I've already discussed why you can't resolve energy prices, but it also doesn't make sense to resolve energy efficiency. When studies are conducted upon how consumers respond to increases in energy efficiency, there's actually a sort of paradoxical relationship, not a symbiotic one. This is Yevon's paradox. When energy becomes more efficient, we don't consume less energy, we, just, we consume more of it because now we're more efficient. We don't decrease our energy demand. Third is jobs. They may be right that they may create a ton of energy jobs, but energy jobs are not the only jobs at stake. Because of America's substantially lower energy prices, every other industry in the world that uses electricity wants to work in America, not just energy jobs. That's hundreds of millions of economic opportunities that they would forego. If Germany is the example you want to cite, their government officials are now warning of a rapid deindustrialization because nobody wants to work in Germany anymore with the high electricity prices. Now, if the environment is an important concern, they still don't have a good means to address it. Countries like China and India have a fundamentally different economic situation than the United States. They are developing countries and they need a plan that won't subject hundreds of millions of people in their country to poverty and starvation. India already can't afford to provide electricity to 400 million people. That's about the populations of US and Mexico combined, or one in three people in India. If we don't show them a model that's economically feasible, they won't just get on board and follow a signal. Allowing energies like natural gas, which burn cleaner and have caused the US to reduce emissions even more than Germany has, will enable other countries to pursue a slow, clean transition as opposed to a forced one. The plan of the proposition will not achieve 100% renewables, but it will force some renewables into the market, raising prices for everybody and not effectively decreasing emissions. Thank you.
point where you talk about um, this transition to natural gas and then that being the transition to potentially more renewables. Mm -hmm. So in your, we've outlined a very clear advocacy, 100% by 2030 of WWS technologies. We've outlined all the different technologies that would be used and why they're beneficial. What would be the composition of your future energy by 2030? Uh, Give me a percentage of natural gas, renewables, would you include nuclear? How much coal would still be used? I don't think I should make the call on the percentage as determined by economics. Natural gas right now is not only a clean fuel, but is one of the cheapest fuels, and increasingly so because of all the new right. technologies but we have to what harness. Does the what does the against team right. defend in this round? We have defended a clear policy with four advantages. And we defend what, not doing that policy. Right. But what are the bad reasons for why doing the policy would exist? You haven't presented any sort of counter proposal. What would be, what would be the alternative? Well, the alternative is how things are going right now. How things are going right now. Yes. Okay. So look, just exactly the same as the status quo. Yes. Not changing right. it to forcefully so, insert renewables into so the market by 2030. In the status quo, have you disputed the claim that climate change will continue to cost $70 billion If emissions a year are unchanged, but we're warming. citing trends that already the U.S. is reducing emissions by increasing its use of natural gas, more so than countries shifting which, to renewables. Which trend have you cited? What do you mean, which, which trend? What the number of, of evidence, emissions, it's going down. What evidence, what evidence Despite have energy you, consumption going what down. What model, what piece of evidence have you cited for that claim? What do you mean, if you go to the Energy Information Administration website, they how just keep does, track of how does your How does that transition affect the 62,000 people that are dying from air pollution every well, year? Well, air pollution has gone down from transportation sector 90% since 1998. I'm not sure what negligible decreases negligible? is going to affect those deaths. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about this not in my backyard thing. Um, especially in the context of Iowa. So Iowa leads the U.S. in wind production. Um, farmers seem to be fine with wind farms. What, can you give me an example of not in my backyard in the Great Plains where wind is the most abundant resource? Well, it primarily happened in Vermont when they tried to artificially force right. wind farms on so people. So that was our East Coast argument about offshore wind. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I want to move on to the lower prices of every other industry argument. Um, how long will natural gas have a lower price than renewable energy, and how does that account for our volatility argument in energy prices? Well, I think as renewable energies get better, the volatility of natural gas will lead people away from natural gas without a sort of forceful insertion of renewables in the short term. So as long but as... So as of now, it's definitely way cheaper. What is the... How, why would natural gas lead to renewables? What is the reason for that? Well, people are developing renewables all over the country and all over the world already. Right. right? So those technologies are going to improve. And when they reach price parity with natural gas, then those technologies will take over. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So I guess I have a few minutes to rebut. Um, so let me start, well, let's start with natural gas. Um, first, in the United States, of, of the 60 to 65,000 deaths, about 5,000 are attributed to natural gas mining uh, production and use. And this is, there's a lot of emissions due to just the mining of the gas itself that are uh, from fossil fuels, other fossil fuels. Now, in terms of climate impacts, well, that 5,000 deaths per year is less than coal. Coal causes more deaths than natural gas per kilowatt hour, but gas actually causes more global warming. And why is that? Um, if, especially if you look at the 20-year time frame, which is relevant because of the, not only I mean, natural gas has half the CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour, but it has much more methane emissions. And the latest studies, and there are just a numerous, have come out, the methane emissions are so high, and the global warming potential over 20, five, over 20 years is on the order of 85 to 100 times that of CO2. So you, you end up getting about the same uh, uh, net global warming impacts over 20 years with coal and gas, but when you account for the sulfur emissions from coal, you actually have less global warming effects of coal than gas. So there, coal is worse in terms of pollution, gas is worse in terms of climate, so neither is good. In terms of the energy, wind energy per meter squared, the studies that Mr. Bryce referred to are only studies that look at when you stuff all these wind turbines right next to each other, but in reality you have wind turbines that are spread apart. And when you do that, you get much more efficiency. I mean, you get one result if you put all the wind turbines in the world right next to each other. You get a totally different result in terms of the total energy output from those turbines when you spread them over multiple wind farms all over the world, which is what happens in reality. So in order to convert 
uh, 30% of, of the U.S. energy infrastructure for all purposes to wind. Uh, we need about 350,000 5 megawatt wind turbines on land and then another 20% offshores, another couple hundred thousand. And that would take, of, it would only take four square kilometers of footprint on the ground, but it would take about two and a half percent of the, the U.S. land area, which is trivial. Now, we never propose to use biofuels. Biofuels would use uh, 15 times more land than the spacing of wind and a million times more land than the footprint of wind. So that's not even an issue. Uh, in terms of uh, trans like transportation from vehicles, well, certainly long distance trucks would be a combination of electric and hydrogen fuel cells. So we wouldn't just have electric long distance trucks unless we can get fast refueling stations. So that's not even an issue. Uh, in terms of costs of renewable energy, uh, it might be surprised to our opponents that wind is the cheapest form of electric power in the U.S. at 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour unsubsidized and 2 cents a kilowatt hour subsidized, according to Lazard, which is the uh, most prestigious uh, industry es uh, estimator for 2013. And solar, utility scale solar is now 6 to 8 cents a kilowatt hour in 2013, which is the same as natural gas. So it's, it's the same. Rooftop solar is more expensive. In terms of offshore wind, uh, offshore wind is on large scale is about 10 to 11 cents a kilowatt hour as estimated by Willett Kempton at University of Delaware from some published studies that they have done and 15 cents a kilowatt hour at current rates. Okay, so I'm here to conclude with uh, uh, three minutes. Let's be clear that our opponents who are for the caption have still not answered the fundamental question about transportation infrastructure. I brought it up at the very beginning. Where will we get the liquid fuels? And their answer is, well, we'll go to electric vehicles and fuel cells. Remember, I mentioned we have 7,000 commercial airplanes and over 200,000 private uh, general aviation airplanes. What about them? Not a word about wh what we will do with that infrastructure. Are we all going to quit flying? Fuel cell vehicles. How many are on the road today? They would be measured in the hundreds. Total for the United States. We have 253 million motor vehicles. Electric long-haul trucks. Now that's a new one on me. Even natural gas fuel trucks that are the latest iteration from Cummins, they, the 12 liter natural gas fuel trucks, some of the cleanest burning engines on the, uh, on the market today, they're not able to, to, to travel in the mountains because they're not powerful enough. And yet, Mr. Ding suggested that we're going to use electric trucks. Well, okay, I'm wondering why that hasn't happened. Oh, I know, it's because the century of the electric vehicle is a century of failure, tailgating failure. We've heard about electric cars for a full century, and what do we have today on the road? Maybe 100,000, maybe 200,000 electric vehicles, and who owns them? The rich. Now, let me, let me point to uh, the issue of today's headlines. 
We have shooting wars from Damascus to Donetsk. The global economy is slowing down again. Oil prices are falling. We've heard, oh, energy prices only rise, fossil fuel prices only rise. Wrong. In the last decade, natural gas prices here in the U.S. were over $8. Today, they're about $4, fallen by half, saving U.S. consumers $200 million a day. That's $73 billion per year. Today, the U.S. economy, the U.S., when it comes to energy infrastructure, is the envy of the world. And if you vote for the caption, you're voting to say, we need to throw away our economic and strategic advantages and wholesale throw them away. Industries from around the world are moving to the United States. Why? Because we have cheap, abundant, reliable energy and the rest of the world does not. Russia has invaded Crimea. Western Europe is now desperately worried about Russian natural gas supplies and here we are in the U.S. sitting upon some of the cheapest natural gas available anywhere. Jobs. Our opponents have stressed that they will create jobs. Well, we could create jobs if we just give people a lot of shovels and tell them to dig holes and build them and fill them back in again. The U.S. natural gas shale revolution is creating huge numbers of jobs. Last year, IHS estimated that two million jobs now are being supported by the unconventional shale and unconventional oil revolution. That number could rise to 3.9 million by 2025. Last year, a study by Purdue economist Wallace Tyner estimated the shale revolution is adding $500 billion in economic activity to the U.S. economy. That's an addition in, in, in U.S. GDP of three percentage points. The caption fails. It fails on the matter of scale. It fa fails on the matter of environment. It fails on the matter of economics. And critically, it fails on the matter of electricity storage. Please vote against the caption. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad I don't have a red and green form, but those of you who do, um, Who's collecting? Let's, we have people coming around to collect your votes. And so will you turn in a vote for the proposition or against the proposition uh, as, as you choose? And we'll see how we uh, as a room would vote if we were uh, the legislature of the United States. Um, so cast your votes and while you're doing that, um, who wants to announce, do the drawing? Steve, are you around? You ready to do the drawing? No, not yet. Okay, so we'll take questions. Questions or comments from the floor. Yes, ma'am.
Okay, any comments from anyone? <laughs> I get <could> speech. <laughs> um, national security is an important issue, um, and yeah, that's something we didn't mention because all the technologies, that, all the wind, water, and solar, and all the technologies would be produced locally in the U.S. And we'd also be doing this in each country of the world. So it's not just the U.S. in isolation. Each country would be safe on its own for its own renewable energy. Although smaller countries might have to rely on interconnected grids with other countries. So I'll just just address that point. Ed efficiency is included in our plans. Building energy efficiency is included. We just didn't have time to talk about it. <coughs> materials as well. No, I'll just make one quick comment. Um, and James Hansen has written a lot about climate change and he's been very critical of the belief that renewables can solve all of our energy needs. And in fact, I can quote him almost directly and he said anyone who believes that Inter that renewable energy can meet 100% of our needs also probably believes in the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. Yes, sir, and there's apparently, oh good, microphones, yeah, here, and then we'll go to the back. I, I really, uh, I agree with the opposition in the sense, uh, in the sense of, one of the biggest problems, and, and Mark and I know each other, so we've talked about this, they brought up a very good point about the heavy class eight trucks. We do not have a non-liquid solution for that yet. Smith uh, in Kansas City is working on electric cars, but I would bring uh, awareness to the fact that now we have a hydrogen hybrid, as Mark is, has brought up, and PepsiCo has been running uh, their trucks, number of their trucks on that, 100 million miles, and we just got a report today that they were able to reduce fuel consumption by 18% while increasing the power by 12%. So there are gonna be hybrids between the opposition and the, uh, the pro forces here uh, that may be uh, transition solutions as we go forward. Co comments? Well, with regard to trucks, I mean, certainly aircraft will be the hardest to change. But you know the space shuttle run on, runs on cryogenic hydrogen, ran on cryogenic hydrogen. The Russians built one in the 1980s, so it's a technology that exists for aircraft. Now, for long-distance trucks, I mean, I mean the torque in electric electricity is so much greater than in gasoline, and so and also we've had hydrogen fuel cell buses running around California for a long time. Now these aren't long distance. But it's not. It's not a new. It's just a matter of getting the tech industry to do it. And that's why aggressive policies need to be put in place. It's not a technological issue to get long-distance trucks running on a combination of hydrogen and electricity hybrids. It's just policies. Well, I, I, w I would submit that it is. It's a big technological problem. Storing hydrogen no, is very, hydrogen is very difficult. Hydrogen is a very small molecule. It's creating the seals, creating the tanks, hydrogen embrittlement. It's a very difficult process. We, uh, how do you create hydrogen? Hydrogen, it doesn't just come out of the ground. It has to be manufactured. And that comes with a carbon footprint. We're producing hydrogen today mainly from natural gas. I, I'm familiar with the, the engineers at Toyota. They're bullish on fuel cells and more so than CNG because fuel cells are more efficient. And so they can get better range than they can with CNG or with electric vehicles. But it, it, we're still not at a point where fuel cells are even remotely close to being available in the commercial sector because they still remain too expensive. It remains a killer app. I would love to have a fuel cell at my house. But we're, the, the, to one last point on efficiency. Why has the internal combustion engine lasted so long? because it, gets, it has been improved incredibly. Today's engines are not just the same old engines that we drove 20, 30 years ago. They are, in fact, electronic engines. We've added silicon. We've added intelligence to the, in, to the, to the fuel systems, to the exhaust systems. We're now doing uh, energy harvesting with, uh, with thermal harvesting, with kinetic harvesting. The, the internal combustion engine is going to maintain its position in the market for a very, very long time. Quick rebuttal. First of all, all our hydrogen would be produced from electrolysis, from wind and solar, It'd be totally carbon free except for the manufacture of the turbines. Uh, in terms of the efficiencies, the hydrogen fuel cell efficiency from going from the wind turbine to the electrolyzer to the compressor to the fuel to the fuel cell, it's about 28 to 30 percent efficiency compared to 17 to 20 percent for the internal combustion engine. Uh, electric vehicles are about 80 to 86 percent, so you get three times more efficiency with electricity, but you get still get more efficiency with hydrogen over gasoline and the final thing is as I said hydrogen fuel cell buses have been running for almost a decade or more in California and there hasn't been any of this big problem that you just mentioned gentleman in the back oh, 
Brilliantly done. Uh, thank you all for what you've been doing. I taught urban planning for 25 or more years here in Iowa City. And despite that, I'm very skeptical about the idea of preparing a plan, especially at a national scale, to make a, an enormous transition like this. What I am in favor of is a strategy, a, an energy strategy that will enable us to make a transition. So with that in mind, I wonder if the, the two teams could respond to the idea of doing what a good economist would advocate, using prices as, an, as a, a, a means of sending signals to producers and consumers that would enable us to make this transition. I think in particular of the proposal that the Citizens Climate Lobby has been proposing uh, to uh, legislators for the last couple or three years, which would re uh, uh, involve a revenue neutral fee and dividend approach that would involve a steadily escalating fee on uh, carbon per ton emitted by whatever sources there are. Would that not in, uh, lead us to, uh, uh, enable us to devise a strategy that would mobilize the uh, technological prowess of entrepreneurs and uh, the price incentives and so on and enable us to make the kind of transition we need to make? Can we price our way to the uh, solution or at least price our way to uh position where the two sides agree. Well, I certainly agree that the key to all this is policies, and it may be difficult at the national scale to get policies implemented. That's why we actually focus on states, individual states, and once you kind of get a critical mass of states, then you can get some national policy. But it's all driven by specific pol policies, but we don't actually advocate one policy over another. It's really what's the goal, and let each state or even local municipality determine what's the best way to get to that goal. So there are that, the policy you mentioned could be one, uh, but there are many others, I just, so I don't want to be too specific about a policy because there are so many possible policies that can be implemented. Mr. Bryce, comment? Well, uh, I think the primary concern is the, okay, awesome. Uh, the incredible difficulty that comes with setting a price or a fee uh, at the right level, um, set low, people just sort of say whatever, I'll pay a higher price, and set too high, there can be sort of uh, pretty substantial economic costs that rather than sort of drive innovation, just sort of uh, cause bankruptcy uh, when people have to shut down production. Um, Well, I'll just add one a quick comment. I mean, we have heard many, many times about the, the possibility of a carbon tax. I used to believe the carbon tax was the way forward. I don't believe it anymore. Why? The U.S. could, of course, impose a carbon tax on itself. Well, what would that achieve? Well, it would mean higher energy prices for us. But what, what have we seen in the climate meetings in Copenhagen, Bonn, Durban, Paris, we had the recent meeting in New York just last month. What's been the result of all the discussions of all the climate change meetings that have happened in the last five to ten years? Effectively nothing. Why? Because you have countries like Korea, uh, uh, South Korea building coal-fired power plants. You have Pakistan building coal-fired power plants. Bangladesh, the same. You have countries all over the world turning to coal and realizing that if they want to bring their people out of poverty, they need to create electricity in the cheapest possible manner. Therefore, they're not going to impose any kind of carbon tax on themselves. So the idea that we would impose a carbon tax, well, we could do it, but we're not going to have any kind of internationally harmonized carbon tax. So then are we, we just trade our jobs for jobs overseas. I, I, I just think that, yes, it's a, it's a perfect solution in an imperfect world. Second, it's politically impossible in the United States, in my view, to pass a carbon tax. The public won't have it. So uh, the, uh, what do I favor? I favor governmental, this is where I'm, I'm, I'm not anti-government. What do we need, what are the killer applications? It's gas to liquids technology, it's home-based fuel cells, it's safe, cheap nuclear. We haven't discussed nuclear yet. I'm adamantly pro-nuclear, but it's still way too expensive, and the public still doesn't trust it. But that's where we have to have strong governmental involvement if we're serious about climate change. Nuclear has to be part of the answer, which is, I quoted James Hansen earlier. He just, he and, and Ken Caldera and a number of other, Tom Wigley, just published a, a letter in the last few months saying, if we're serious about carbon dioxide, we gotta get serious about nuclear. And they challenged all the major environmental groups in America to support them. They didn't do it. Uh, one quick thing I'll add, uh, given the discussion between the difficulty of 
establishing such a policy at the national level and looking to the states. Uh, those states have options for pursuing a lot of policies. Uh, establishing a carbon tax is pretty difficult given that uh, utility companies often operate uh, across state lines, which means if Illinois sets the tax higher than Iowa, there becomes an incentive for those uh, utility companies to generate all the energy in Iowa and just move it over to Illinois. And if Illinois were to try and regulate Iowa and uh, generation, there would be some issues with the uh, interstate commerce clause and those laws would probably get struck down. Just okay, when I was a debater, the affirmative always got the last word. So, Mr. Jacobson, you mm -hmm. obviously wanted to speak to yeah, this, and then I to, didn't see any other hands, so we'll see how the vote went after this. I, I just want to respond to um, the point about other countries not having a carbon tax. I think at some point, the U.S. needs to recognize that we have been the major contributor to global warming. About 20% of all of global warming can be attributed to the United States. We. Um, so I think beyond the cost, beyond the comparison of all these different um, numbers being thrown around, at some point we need to take like the stance of leadership that says we need to own this issue and perhaps there will be small sacrifices in the short term and perhaps countries like India who need to get their countries out of poverty will still use fossil fuels. Um, in the long run, the technology, the technology improvements that are made in the U.S. can be transferred to other countries. Um, that's the beauty of technology transfer, and I think that's the type of leadership that the U.S. needs to implement. Um, I just want to speak to the nuclear issue because it's been brought up and I never had a chance to mention it. I mean, the one reason this will never happen, if we try to focus on nuclear, I mean, besides the fact that if you want, if you want to power the world on nuclear, you need about 16,850 megawatt nuclear power plants. We have about 450 today and about 400 operational. Most countries are reducing them. And you need so many, and have five countries of the world have secretly developed nuclear weapons under the guise of a civilian nuclear energy program. So you, you, if you start even double, if you even double the nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, energy facilities worldwide, you'd have about 800. That's only going to cover a few percent. And it takes between 10 and 19 years to put up, to plan and operate and permit um, a one nuclear power plant. And so by the time you even put up one, this Arctic sea ice will be gone. It takes two to five years for the average wind farm. And you have this opportunity cost that, int that results in additional emissions associated because you have to run the re regular electric power grid. And in addition to the fact that you have to continuously mine and refine uranium, which is energy intensive. So the emissions from nuclear power, when you actually compare it to wind, is, is nine to 25 times higher per kilowatt hour generated. It's less than natural gas, which is about 60 to 70 times higher than wind, but it's still not zero. And you have all the nuclear waste issues, and one and a half percent of all nuclear reactors ever built have melted down to some degree. So it's just never going to happen, so we should not even talk about it. And besides the fact it costs, according to Lazard, in 2013, the average cost of nuclear is 12 cents a kilowatt hour, which is, compares to 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour for wind and 6 to 8 percent a kilowatt hour for even natural gas or utility solar. So it has so many issues, it's just not going to happen. I'm, I'm told that there were some more hands coming up, and I can't see, so I'll let the people who have the mics <laughs> pick. Okay. Uh, back to nuclear. Is there a safe place on the planet to even put a nuclear energy plant? Well, it's, all, it's just a risk. You know, it, it depends how much risk you want to take. So each place, there's a certain risk of catastrophic meltdown, of weapons proliferation, of uh, you can even have large blackout, blackouts due to the fact that when the temperature rises and you need to, the water is too hot and you have to shut down the plants as happens in Europe whenever they have a heat wave. So, yeah. Well, uh, I was just in Japan last month. If nuclear can't work in Japan, it can't work anywhere. And right now, the nuclear sector in Japan is in crisis. I'm not sanguine about nuclear. I take all of Dr. Jacobson's points about nuclear. It's way too costly. There, 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 there are very few countries that have the physical and intellectual infrastructure that will allow them to adopt nuclear. But I stridently, vehemently disagree with his point, as I wrote it down, we should not even talk about nuclear. Yes, we should talk about nuclear. We absolutely must talk about nuclear. It's where James Hansen has said, it, we have to get serious about nuclear. There's a growing movement on the left among the Greens, Stuart Brand, uh, Ted Nordhaus, Michael Schellenberger, the Breakthrough Institute saying, we have to get serious about nuclear. I agree. But I'm not sanguine about just that it's going to be easy or that it's going to happen quickly. It won't. 
the, 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 the fuel cycle issue is a very serious one. The, the weapon, wep potential for weaponization, again, is serious, but the power density of nuclear cannot be matched. And uh, therefore, if we're serious about reducing carbon dioxide, we gotta get serious. But, but the, that requires governmental inter involvement, and therein is another problem. The old joke is that you know, solar is, uh, uh, nuclear is solar for Republicans, right? Well, you know, I think there's some truth to that. But I, I'm adamantly pro-nuclear, but I'm not gonna stand up here and say it's gonna be easy. It's not, and it's not gonna happen for decades. New Scale, which has the inside track to build small modular reactor here in the US, even their best estimate that the, the soonest they'd be able to bring it online would be 2022. That's eight years for 125 megawatts of capacity. It's nothing. Halo. Ames. We said Halo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Good one. Three, three quick, uh, three quick comments. Uh, I am slowly getting through this book, Reinventing Fire by Amory Lovins. It's a slow slog. But basically, to boil it down to one sentence, the guy is brilliant. He started Rocky Mountain Institute. I met him years ago when I was an energy coordinator in Minnesota. But basically, in this book, he is saying that we can increase our economy by 158% by 2050 with no nuclear, no coal, no oil, and one-third less natural gas through efficiencies, alternatives, integrative design, and materials research. It's a fascinating book, and I'm learning a lot. So I suggest that everyone who's interested in this field get a hold of this book. Uh, two, um, I take your point, uh, Mr. Bryce, about Mr. Hansen's uh, comment about um, uh, the use of nuclear uh, fuel. And again, it gets be it's because of his concern of climate change uh, and peaking soon and then reducing our use of, of fossil fuels. But I think it would be wonderful if the uh, Iowa Policy Center could bring both Mr. Lovins and Mr. Hansen to the University of Iowa so they could tough it out on this issue <laughs> of whether we really do, in fact, need nuclear fuels because they both have excellent arguments. Um, Amory, more on the efficiencies. Uh, I don't know if he has a timeline on climate change like Hansen does, and of course Hansen knows the, the other issue. And maybe we could come up with a wonderful strategy between uh, Lovins and Hansen. Thank you. I think just to add um, a comment on the nuclear, I think the conception that we can't put a nuclear plant anywhere is a little bit flawed. Um, I think I'm more more sympathetic to the no, nuclear. We could put it in Ames, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, but if you look <laughs> at studies, um, and maybe these studies don't account for the secondary um, radiation effects where you can't really attribute which deaths um, came from where, but if you look at studies, nuclear is safer than, um, safer than even wind and some renewable energies in terms of total amounts of deaths um, per kilowatt hour of operation. Um, the problem with nuclear, like everyone's been saying, is it takes too much time. And I think where we disagree is just that our side believes we don't have that time. Um, the tipping points are coming, and renewable costs, as Dr. J uh, Professor Jacobson has said, are low now. If we do have time, there are way better options than nuclear fission power to be studying. Nuclear fusion would operate, would, would op and other innovative energy solutions would be the way to invest that time, if we had time, into that sort of research. Well, the oh. comment here. Sure. Uh, I have a question: whether or not the gentleman from the Manhattan Institute would be in favor of abolishing the subsidies that the federal government has been giving to the fossil fuels industry for, I think, decades now, or whether or not his objection to helping the, uh, say, solar or wind industries. Uh, and their innovation is an ideological problem. I'm for abolishing all subsidies, fair field, no favor. I have 3,200 watts of solar panels on the roof of my house. So I, uh, you know, why did I put them on? Because I got a big fat subsidy. So I'm in favor of eliminating all subsidies unless I'm getting them, all right? <laughs> 
this idea that the, the uh, you know, we've heard this over and over, the oil and gas industry gets unconscionable subsidies. They get tax treatments that allow accelerated depreciation on their capital costs. The production tax credit given to the wind industry is then handled by the investment bankers and then sold to other industries to, uh, to reduce their tax burdens. Look, you know, I, I, again, let's let them all compete fair field no favor, and then we'll see who wins. Clearly solar is making inroads, and solar is, and solar and storage, I'll be clear, and I've written about it, this is a, this is a potentially disruptive technology, not just here in the United States, but all over the world, particularly in tropical areas and in, in, in uh, equatorial areas and island economies. Uh, Aquion Energy, in my new book, I write about Aquion. It's a battery company in Pittsburgh. Where are their first target markets? Island economies. And their idea is battery, solar, diesel. And arbitraging across those three forms and because island economies have generally the highest cost of electricity. So we're getting to a, a point in the solar industry, some of the people in the wind industry have already said, we don't need any more subsidies. I think that that's the way forward. And I'm in fully in favor of that. Um, I just wanted to comment and say that when you refer to markets and this idea that let technologies play out, remove subsidies, uh, it assumes that markets are not socially constructed. And that, you know, markets are sort of handed down by this invisible hand and that that determines the technologies we use. So I, I want to know um, if we think about all of the lobbying and path dependencies that go into our current infrastructure, you say so, so hard to change, um, why, why would you say that let the market solve something when it's socially constructed to begin with? Are, are you suggesting the wind and solar industries haven't been effective in their lobbying? where you have more than 30 states now have renewable portfolio standards? I think they've been quite effective. But it, look, your question is about political influence. It's market influences that are gonna be the decider. If solar can come in and come in and, and allow homeowners to produce electricity more cheaply than they can buy it from the grid, they're gonna buy it. Why has natural gas been made inroads against coal in the US? Why has the US reduced its CO2 emissions more than any other country in the world since 2005? Because natural gas is underpricing coal in the power generation sector. It's not a, not a government mandate. I mean, it's an interesting theoretical point that you bring up that markets are a social construction. Um, two things on that. They're pretty socially established, um, and there's powerful forces at work, powerful industries and corporations that operate by those market rules. So I don't think you're going to be able to change that, uh, completely abolish that. I guess what you can do is kind of shape the way in which they're socially constructed. So sort of some of the uh, models that Dr. Jacobson's research indicates is if you include all the social costs um, into the market transactions and how the market views energies, um, wind and solar would be way cheaper than coal and natural gas. So yeah, you can use that to sort of shape the way in which we uh, view markets and view costs in the market, but I don't know if it means that we would never want to use the market at all. Uh, do it. I, I just wonder how, how do you, how do, we can do all we can. But a power lying government, why don't government address it? it so we have a, we have a November 2nd, no candidate has spoken on it. Why, why and what can we do to change? I know, I know. All right, sir. But you are critical, yes, sir. If we don't, what can we do to our leaders in government? Because no one has a dread yet but Obama. So, what, what can we do to get the, our political leaders to deal, to address these issues? Because they're in the middle of an election and they aren't talking about them. Well, at the national level, it's very difficult to get agreement to do anything. So again, you have to go down to smaller scales and see where you have people who are willing to make changes. So there's some states that are very willing to make changes. Um, 
And I think that's really where you have to start. You have to start at the smaller scale and move up. I mean, there is this natural transition going on right now. I mean, right now, about 12.5% of all the electric power in the US is wind, water, solar. 6% is wind and solar and geothermal, and the other half is hydroelectric. And that, the wind and solar used to be about 1% just a few years ago. It's, there's been a natural growth. 33% of all the heating and cooling is actually electric already. And transportation, there are you know, a few hundred thousand cars in the US that are electric. But to make to do a more rapid conversion, you really need to focus yeah, on smaller scales, state, each state one at a time, basically. And doing that, and there are some states that really do want to make changes, and they're more aggressive than other states. Uh, but I can't say there's a magic bullet. It's really the people have to want to want to make a change. I mean, collectively, we all have to want to do this. If we don't want to do it, then it's not going to happen. Any other thoughts on that? Shane? I mean, sort of related to the earlier point, I think that um, social constructions play a large role. If there's not a social force in favor of something, the political candidates have no incentive to, you know, take a stand on it. And I think that uh, candidates are consistently let off the hook for not taking a position on things. Uh, related to energy. And I think it really is just about larger numbers of people saying, if you don't take a position on this and it's not a good one, you don't get my vote. I think it's just plain political calculus. Democrats aren't going to talk about a carbon tax. They're not going to talk about raising the gasoline tax. They're not going to talk about being anti-hydraulic fracturing or anti-natural gas or anti-coal right before the midterm elections. This is clear. I mean, you know, this is one of the things Republicans are trying to use against the Democrats. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I'm a member of the disgusted party. But this is just simple politics. And the Democrats are very worried about any policy that they have that would appear to make energy more expensive. And further, it's interesting to watch the Obama administration when it comes to natural gas and hydraulic fracturing. In the last State of the Union address, the President did not mention biofuels or wind, or wind energy once. He mentioned natural gas six times. Ernie Moniz and his predecessor, Steve Chu, mentioned natural gas all the time. They understand the economic benefits of the oil and gas boom in the United States. Why, is oil, why are oil prices falling today, despite all the unrest globally? Because the U.S. has increased its oil production by about 50 percent in the last few years. It's unbelievable what has happened here in the United States, and it's accruing to the benefit of the United States, both economically and strategically. Lab was the uh, uh, was the city Ames uh, that uh, helped end World War II by creating the uh, uranium uh, in the uh, the bombs that we used in, in Japan. So just to defend my uh, colleagues at the Ames Laboratory, but as a member of the team at the Illinois Institute of Technology, and we re research this all the time, we're very interested in storage, and I think that's one field that you both agree upon. And uh, we've just uh, uh, submitted to the World Health Organization a solar and storage unit that we placed into medical clinics in uh, Sierra Leone uh, to help refrigerate the vaccine that we expect to come out for the Ebola virus in, in December. Uh, but it's a one kilowatt, a two kilowatt unit. Professor Jacobson, we've talked about this before, but why have we been so slow in getting a utility scale storage system? We've got FERC 755, we've got in, uh, government support and, and financial incentives to put utility solar into, or utility storage into place for solar and wind, but we still have moved very, very slowly in that regard. Well, I think part of it is there's been less need. I mean, there is some natural storage, hydroelectric is storage, and there, there has been a lot of ice storage under buildings. I mean, there are hundreds of uh, stadiums and universities that have ice storage. My university's had ice storage since 1998. And just, it uses it to balance loads when it needs to. And there's th underground storage. There's all sorts of storage that's pretty cheap. It, but there's a lot of focus lately on battery storage, which is 10 times more expensive than ice storage, which is another five times more expensive than like chilled water storage. And so, there's just because now there's more of a need, now that you have more intermittent wind and solar that are coming onto the grid, suddenly there's a, this demand for this storage. It wasn't there before. 
I'll just, uh, there, I did read a story today, this was on Bloomberg, and I think it was published today or yesterday about California's bringing on a 50 megawatt hour lithium ion battery storage facility in Southern California. It's a pretty big battery. But California's also mandated that their utilities add storage. So that's the only reason it's happening in California. Now, there is a sodium sulfur battery in West Texas where the, it's a very long single power line that goes down to the, um, in the Rio Grande Valley. Or it's not the, the, fine, the most southern most part of Texas, but there are areas where batteries make sense already on the grid just for stability purposes. It have nothing to do with renewables. And so, you know, batteries are getting better, but they're still not orders of magnitude better than what Edison and Volta worked with. I just wanted to ask the panel to comment on the subject of scale and coordination in getting to a national renewable energy system. Um, and I wanted to come back to the issue that came up briefly in the, in the first presentations about the intermittency of renewable energy and the need, and I, I just can't see how we're going to get beyond the need for baseload capacity um, in moving to wind and solar, uh, and the baseload has to come from uh, either natural gas or nuclear or coal. And the other issue is uh, in regards to the NIMBY uh, syndrome, uh, mentioned uh, people not wanting wind farms uh, near where they live, but it seems to be one of the uh, emerging issues in this regard with renewable energy technologies is long distance transmission lines. Um, and that's going to be a hard sell for people in the Midwest and, and the West. So I was wondering if people, uh, the panel could c comment on that. Well, yeah, I can comment um, on, well, long distance transmission, use high voltage direct current, and the it's actually beneficial because you really combine geographically dispersed wind and solar. So when the wind's not blowing in one place, it's often blowing somewhere else. So there's a benefit of combining wind and also solar from geographically far away places to smooth out the load. And, but in the cost, if you use HVDC, and if you actually amortize over the actual correct lifetime of the transmission lines, which is 70 years uh, for most of the components, then the cost going 2,000 kilometers is about one cent a kilowatt hour mean with a range of 0.3 to 3 cents a kilowatt hour, which is compared to the average price of electricity in the US about 13 and a half cents is not huge for that long distance transmission. So it's really, but it comes down to a zoning issue. Nobody wants to put transmission in their backyard. So it's not really a technical or economic issue, the transmission, it's really trying to get permission. But the re question is about the zoning issue. Oh, about the, yeah, well, that's, all, that's a political, that's for a social and political. <laughs> but I do want to say one thing about baseload. So baseload is really overplayed because power demand is not smooth. Power demand is variable. So the key is to match the demand, and you can't do that with baseload, especially if you have larger and larger intermittent sources, the baseload becomes more worthless. So what you really need to do is, that's why demand response comes into play. And, and right now, the way we match demand is either with hydro or natural gas by using peaker plants, which are really expensive because you, you let them sit there in spinning reserve modes. And so the cost of a peaker plant for natural gas is about 17 cents a kilowatt hour to run that. Uh, according to, again, Lazard's you know, study, that's what his number is, around 17 cents. And hydro, though, you can turn it off instantaneously. It's still on the order of three to four cents a kilowatt hour. So if you have hydro, that's the best way to balance loads. But you know, really to balance those loads in a future energy economy, you have more flexible loads, so not you actually can shift the times of the demand. You can change the demand curve with transportation, with industry, and some of heating and cooling, and some of electric power. So there's just it's a totally different paradigm when you go to 100% renewable energy. It's completely different than what you see today. Your demand loads will change, and you can actually shift them to match the supply rather than the other way around. I'll just make one quick point on the, <clears throat> the siting of, of electric power lines. It is, in, it is very controversial. I live in Texas. It's been very controversial for this, these CREZ lines that are coming from the Panhandle in Texas down to Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, and the landowners whose land was appropriated for these power lines were, were vehemently opposed and protested. Similar in the UK, similar in Germany. Uh, you know, I think that you have to make it worth their while. 
if you're going to if you're going to take their land for this purpose, which benefits them not at all, they're not using that electricity. You got to pay them, and I think it makes sense to pay them. Uh, similar to a highway toll or something that they get an ongoing revenue source because their land is being used. So, um, but yeah, I mean, these, these siting issues, particularly, I mean, Dr. Jacobson talked about 350,000 wind turbines. We have 60,000 megawatts roughly of capacity here in the U.S. at two megawatts each, that's 30,000. We're talking about a tenfold, 12-fold increase in the number of wind turbines in the U.S. You don't think there's going to be a backlash? I think there will be. I'm, uh, I, I promised these guys I, we wouldn't keep them up here forever, so um, I'm going to announce the results of your vote, and um, then we'll thank our panels, and then we have a drawing, I believe, do we not, um, for the students. So the, the vote was, uh, I think, 68 for the proposition and 25 against the proposition. So we know how this crowd leans. Um, tomorrow, I remind you, tomorrow we have a, a series of panels, and they'll be discussing some of these very issues, including the infrastructure issues that are so critical that have been discussed here. But please uh, join me in thanking the panelists once again, and yourselves. <laughs>